All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, I am Major Jessica C. Cadell. I am a resident fellow with the Modern War Institute and a instructor in the Defense and Strategic Studies program. So thank you for attending today's MWI Speaker Series event with Dr. Hal Brands. Uh, Dr. Brands is the Henry A. Kissinger Distinguished Professor of Global Affairs at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He is the author, most recently, of American Grand Strategy in the Age of Trump. And he's also written, edited several other books, including Making the Unipolar Moment, U.S. Foreign Policy and the Rise of Post-Cold War Order. From 2015 till 2016, Dr. Brand served as a special assistant to the Secretary of Defense for Strategic Planning, and he's consulted with a range of government agencies and think tanks. He's also served as a lead writer for the Commission on the National Defense Strategy of the United States. And today, Dr. Brands is going to discuss President Trump's foreign policy and the dimensions of grand strategy. We will have time for questions at the end. So thank you very much, Dr. Brands. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks very much uh, for having me, and thanks for everybody for, for coming out today. Uh, I understand there's, I guess, a little bit of competition in terms of speakers today. Uh, so I, I hope I'm not keeping anybody from General Votel. Uh, but I, I just promise, if, if you bear with me, I will uh, do my best to make the next uh, three hours as, as painless as possible. <laughs> so. Um, the, the title of, of the talk, I guess formally, is American Grand Strategy in an Age of Upheaval. Uh, but the, this talk also has an informal title as well, which is, uh, why is the world such a mess? Uh, and, and so that, that's the question I'm going to address to, today. And in the spirit of uh, loyalty to my home institution, so as was mentioned a second ago, uh, I work in the Henry Kissinger Center uh, for Global Affairs at, at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, I'm actually going to start my talk with a quote uh, from Kissinger. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start by trying to answer this question by, by starting with this quote. And so in a landmark essay that he published uh, almost exactly 50 years ago, so I think he completed it in late 1968 and then, and then published it in early 1969 when he'd become uh, the National Security Advisor, uh, Kissinger started with one of these sort of grand uh, Olympian pronouncements for, for which he's famous. And, and he wrote that, Quote, the essence of a revolution is that it appears to contemporaries as a series of more or less unrelated upheavals. Uh, but the crises which form the headlines of the day are symptoms of deep-seated structural problems. Uh, and Kissinger said this, you've got to remember, at a time when uh, the Vietnam War was raging uh, and the United States ha had no obvious way out of that conflict, uh, at a time when uh, the Sino-Soviet split was emerging, at a time when U.S. alliances uh, were under pressure really around the world, and, and just in general, when uh, the post-World War II international system was undergoing deep strains that would test U.S. policymakers for a number of years. Uh, but I actually think the quote is quite relevant to our own time uh, as well. So uh, if you just kind of look around the world today, it, it often seems like you see nothing but, but crisis, whether uh, that's the instability and violence that we're seeing along uh, Russia's periphery, whether it's the growing frictions between the United States and China, uh, the dangers posed by, by North Korea and its nuclear capability, um, the really significant disorder we're seeing now in the Middle East, or, or, or whatever. I mean, the world just seems uh, less stable and more dangerous now than at any time since the Cold War. And it just seems like both the number and the severity of, of global crises are, are increasing. Um, but, but what I want to take away from the Kissinger quote is just this point that the crises don't occur in a vacuum, that they're symptomatic of deeper international changes. And so we really can't figure out where we should go in the world, or even what, what our problems are in the world, uh, if we don't figure out what those uh, deeper changes are. Uh, and I think when we, when we talk about geopolitical change today, uh, we often talk about those changes in terms of uh, polarity. So this is kind of a political science concept uh, referring to the distribution of power in the international system. So, uh, has America's unipolar moment ended? Uh, has a multipolar world emerged? Uh, and so on. But, but what I'm going to argue here is that this debate is actually misleading. So, so on the one hand, uh, questions of, of polarity often exaggerate American decline. They make it seem like we're doing worse than we actually are. Uh, on the other hand, I think the polarity debate actually um, covers up. It obscures both the, the breadth and the severity of the challenges uh, that are at work in the international system. 
uh, and that are facing us today. And, and so what I'm going to argue here is that the fundamental fact of international politics today is that the post-Cold War period is over. Right? So the post-Cold War period uh, was sort of this 25-year stretch after 1989 or 1991, depending on how you're counting. And it really had a handful of defining features. Uh, the first was uncontested US and Western primacy, or uncontested US and Western leadership. Uh, big declines in both uh, great power conflict and ideological conflict around the world. Uh, and then remarkable global cooperation, remarkable diplomatic and even military cooperation in addressing key international security challenges. Right? So it was a pretty good era from the perspective of the United States. But that era is now over, and we're moving into a more dangerous and a more unsettled period that's de defined by five key characteristics of its own. Uh, and they are, first, the gradual erosion uh, of US and Western primacy. Second, uh, revived great power competition across all three key regions of Eurasia and beyond. Uh, third, the renewal of global ideological conflict, in this case between liberalism and illiberalism, or authoritarianism and democracy. Uh, and then fourth, uh, sort of a generalized growth of international strife uh, and disorder. And then the impact of all these forces is being compounded by the fifth characteristic, which is just growing uncertainty about whether the United States and the other defenders of the international system are going to keep playing that role. So what I'm going to do for the next 25, 30 minutes is just to walk you guys through the post-Cold War era in a little bit more detail, and then I'll talk about each of the issues uh, reshaping global politics today. Uh, and so I, th I think the best way to understand uh, where we are today is to compare it to the, the era that, that we're leaving. And, and so as I said, the post-Cold War era is really defined by four phenomena that made it remarkably, even um, unprecedentedly favorable to American interests. And, and the first was just uncontested U.S. primacy, meaning that the United States was just by far the dominant actor in the international system. The United States came out of the Cold War uh, with clear economic leadership. Uh, we had about 25% of global GDP in 1994. That was two to two and a half times the share of the nearest competitor, which also happened to be a close US ally, Japan. The United States accounted for about 40% uh, of world defense spending at that time. Uh, and we had just, just utterly unrivaled advantages in, in global power projection capabilities. And, and the crucial point here is that these capabilities not only gave the United States uh, an enormous global lead over any single competitor, they also meant that we could marshal decisive military force in any key strategic region around the world. So we, we were not just the dominant military power in our own backyard, we were the dominant military power in everybody else's backyard as well. And this is what Saddam Hussein discovered in 1991. The United States uh, could make itself the dominant military power even in an area that, that was 8,000 miles away. Uh, and that American dominance wasn't simply unilateral. It wasn't just a function of our own strength. It was accentuated by the strength of what you might think of as the broader Western coalition. So basically, the United States plus all of its, its treaty allies. So again, in, in 1994, uh, America's treaty allies in, in Europe, so the NATO, NATO allies plus Canada, uh, and then the, the five countries that are, were our treaty allies at that point in the Asia Pacific, uh, accounted for 47% of global GDP and 35% of global military spending. That, that's not including the US shares. And so what this meant is that if you put the US shares together with US allies shares, America and its closest friends had upwards of 70% of global economic power and military spending. Th this was not a balance of power. This was one of the most pronounced imbalances of power the world had ever seen. And it had implications for a big range uh, of global issues. Uh, and one of those issues, probably the most important of those issues, which also happens to be the second key phenomenon of the post-Cold War era, was just the remarkably low level of, of tension and conflict and competition between the major powers in the international system after the Cold War ended. So uh, it, it's sometimes hard to remember this now, but back in the early 1990s, there were a lot of fears that after the Cold War ended, Europe and East Asia were immediately going to go back to sort of rampant instability of the type they had seen uh, in the 1930s. Uh, Germany and Japan were once again going to become aggressive powers that would try to victimize their neighbors and, and dominate their neighborhoods. Uh, in fact, that, that didn't happen. Right? So, so most of the, the major Western powers, particularly the European allies in Japan, remained pretty closely tied to the United States, uh, largely because the United States kept providing what, what are often referred to as global public goods, right? things, things like international security and leadership of an open global economy. And then at the same time, uh, countries that, that might have been tempted to challenge uh, 
uh, American leadership just really couldn't because the power disparity was so great. It, it was dangerous, if not impossible, for countries like Russia and China to mount serious great power or challenges of their own. So if you were Russia, uh, you might not have liked the fact that NATO expanded into Eastern Europe during the 1990s, but there wasn't a whole lot you could do about it. Uh, if you were China, you might have wanted to reabsorb Taiwan and carve out your own sphere of influence in the Western Pacific, but as long as the US Navy was sitting there, you, you couldn't. And, and so as a result of this, uh, the danger of war between the major powers was historically low during the 1990s, and great power rivalries in general were just more <laughs> muted than at any time in, in at least uh, a century. Uh, and then this, this relatively benign state of affairs was also evident in, in a third phenomenon. And, and this is the decline of international ideological competition. Uh, and, and so uh, I imagine a lot of people here have probably heard of, of Francis Fukuyama's end of history thesis. And this was basically the idea that uh, there were no competitors left to, to liberal democracy and democracy in particular after the Cold War, after the collapse of communism. Uh, and we kind of look back on this now and we think, well, this was pretty naive. But, but I think it did capture three indisputable facts about the post-Cold War era. Uh, the first was that democracy and free markets were spreading more widely than, than ever before. They were really spreading like wildfire uh, in the 1990s and early 2000s. Second, the fact that there was just no credible global competitor to, to the democratic model. There, there was no rival ideology out there that a large swath of humanity believed in. There was nothing like communism had been during the Cold War, for instance. Uh, and then the third point was that even former US enemies like Russia, uh, even authoritarian powers like China, were, were really making unprecedented efforts to integrate into the US-led international system, uh, either economically, politically, or, or, or both. And, and this isn't to say that sort of Western concepts of democracy and human rights were, were, were fully accepted by these countries. They weren't. But, but what was clear was that the intense ideological struggles of the 20th century were over, and, and the liberal model, sort of this combination of markets plus democracy, just seemed incontestably ascendant. Uh, and then all of these things fed into the final phenomenon of the post-Cold War era, which was remarkable international cooperation in addressing international threats and international disorder. So once the Cold War ended, there, there was no longer sort of a top-tier existential threat to the United States in the way there had been uh, in the form of the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Uh, and so the United States uh, and the international community writ large basically focused on dealing with those nasty second tier issues like uh, ethnic cleansing, uh, international terrorism, the threat posed by rogue states. Uh, and, the, and the effort to generate international cooperation in dealing with those threats, to, to get sort of a big group of nations together to go after them was just aided tremendously by American dominance and by the absence of great power competition. So, at a time when uh, the major powers were mostly getting along, at a time when the US was basically setting the global agenda, it was a lot easier to organize big coalitions to confront bad actors, whether those actors were Saddam Hussein in, in 1990, 1991, Slobodan Milosevic during the 1990s, or Al-Qaeda uh, after 9-11. Uh, and, and so the basic point I, I would leave you with is just that by any meaningful historical comparison, uh, the structure of international politics during the post-Cold War era was just uniquely favorable to U.S. interests and to U.S. ideals. Uh, but unfortunately, that, that period is over uh, because the global system is now changing in, in five key ways. So let me talk about each of those five ways in a little bit more detail. Okay, the first key shift underway is the erosion of U.S. and Western primacy, right? So it, it's not correct to think that we're headed towards a multipolar system in which you're going to have a bunch of countries that all have more or less equal shares uh, of international power. That, that's not going to happen in any time soon. Uh, China is obviously a competitor to the United States. Its power is rising, but the United States still has big economic advantages over China, uh, including a per capita GDP that's about four times uh, China's. Uh, U.S. defense spending is still about three times uh, China's defense spending. And we just have a, enormous advantages that have been accumulated over many, many years in, in key power projection capabilities like, like aircraft carriers. But, but what has happened over the past 15 years is that the degree of U.S. and Western uh, primacy has diminished. So uh, America's shares of global wealth and military spending have, have declined somewhat. Uh, we had about 25% of global GDP in 2004. It's about 21% today. Uh, the U.S. accounted for about 42% of global military spending in 2004. It's about 33 to 34% today. But where the drop-off has really been more severe is among uh, our allies. Uh, 
Uh, and, and so U.S. allies in Europe and the Asia Pacific uh, had about 47% of global GDP and 35% of global military spending in 1994. Um, those, those shares have both fallen by about 20 to 25% uh, by 2015. And, and in fact, if you look at some of uh, our closest and our traditionally most powerful allies, they've undergone really severe military declines. Uh, the British Royal Navy really used to set the standard for naval power in the world. It, it really can't even patrol the waters around the home islands effectively these days. Uh, Germany was once a major power in Europe. Its military is now full of, of tanks that don't drive, uh, submarines that can't sail, and planes that can't fly. So the US and its democratic partners are still by far uh, the most powerful coalition out there in the world. But the global playing field is just less slanted than it was before. Uh, and this is also the case because uh, the countries you might think of as our authoritarian competitors, so the Russias and Chinas of the world, have been gaining ground. Uh, Russia is obviously still sort of a basket case economically, but it did manage to double defense spending over the course of a decade. Uh, China's power has just grown exponentially. Uh, China had about 2% of world military spending and global GDP uh, in 1994. It had about 12 to 13% of each category in 2016. Uh, and just as, as Russia did, China did the same thing. So China's military buildup has featured exactly the tools that would be needed to contest our power projection in the Western Pacific, uh, as well as, as capabilities uh, needed to project Chinese power even further afield. They've got two aircraft carriers now. Uh, they're looking to have probably five or six within the next couple of decades. And, and so the uncontested US and Western primacy of the 90s has become the more contested primacy of today. And, and this isn't just some sort of academic distinction, right? Because the changing balance of power means that US rivals and competitors uh, now have more ability to shift the international environment to suit their own preferences. And, and this is driving the second big change in global politics today, uh, which is the return of great power competition. Right? So if great power cooperation was the standard uh, during the post Cold War era, great power competition uh, is the norm today. And, and really what's happening is that you're seeing uh, authoritarian countries that never really fully accepted the post-Cold War order that was led by a democratic United States. Those countries are now using their greater relative power to push back against that system in, in key regions like East Asia and the Middle East and, and Eastern Europe. Uh, and, and what's important to remember here is that uh, a country like China can concentrate its resources in the Asia Pacific. A country like Russia can concentrate its resources uh, in Eastern Europe. They can, these, these countries can concentrate their resources regionally. They don't have to distribute them globally in the same way that we do. And so the power shifts that have been occurring in recent years are actually having uh, disproportionate effects at the regional level. Uh, and because sort of the, the regional stability, the regional orders that are now being challenged have been the foundation of the broader post-Cold War environment, uh, these countries are basically destabilizing the system from the bottom up. Uh, and so think about the, the Chinese case in East Asia. Uh, China has, has benefited enormously from the post-Cold War economic order. It's become much, much richer because of its participation in the global economy that the United States leads. Uh, but China doesn't want to be a second-tier power in a US-dominated world. It wants to be a leading power uh, in its own right, and this is entirely natural. Uh, and so Chinese leaders uh, never saw American dominance as something that they were going to accept forever. They saw it, it as something that they would have to suffer for a time before they could uh, assert greater influence in their own right. And, and so as China's uh, national power has grown, uh, China has taken progressively bolder steps to, to create uh, what you might think of as a Sinocentric regional order in East Asia, a regional order built around Chinese leadership. It's done this by claiming most of the South China Sea and East China Sea uh, using techniques like island building to shift facts on the ground in these areas, uh, challenging freedom of navigation, coercing its neighbors, undermining U.S. alliances and partnerships, all of which is underwritten by the military buildup uh, I mentioned. And, and I think these efforts are having an accumulating effect. Uh, the Chinese policy has dramatically altered perceptions of power in the region. Uh, the Chinese military buildup ha has made the outcome of a US-China uh, war over, say, Taiwan, a lot more doubtful. And, and so uh, the president of the Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte, uh, got a lot of headlines in 2016 when he basically said that the United States had lost the struggle for regional supremacy in the Asia Pacific. And I think that's an exaggeration, but it just revealed how competitive uh, the region has become. Uh, and great power competition is even sharper in, in Europe today, because what's happening here is that you have a Russia that is resurgent in a military sense. Uh, and it's using its power to, to reassert its lost influence and try to undo key aspects of the post-Cold War system. And it's done so by uh, 
uh, waging wars of conquest against Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, it's done so by undermining NATO and the European Union through everything from, from military intimidation to political subversion. Uh, and back in 2016, Russian intelligence even apparently tried to assassinate the Prime Minister of Montenegro to prevent that country from, from joining NATO. Uh, and so what Russia is basically doing is, is trying to challenge this idea of a Europe that is whole, free, and at peace, right? It's trying to challenge the institutions like NATO and the EU that have maintained security and prosperity in the region. Uh, and as with China, these actions have all been underwritten by, by military buildup that has given Russia a pretty significant overmatch along NATO's eastern flank. Uh, and it's given Moscow the ability to project power as far afield as the Middle East. And, and so we sometimes talk about this behavior as, as something new, but really it's, it's something old. Russia is just behaving like, like Russia again. It's an ambitious great power that really wants to be the top dog in its immediate neighborhood and, and perhaps beyond. Uh, and then finally, you can see great power competition uh, in the Middle East. Uh, Iran isn't nearly in the same power political class as Russia or China, but, but it is both a regional power and a revolutionary power, and it's seeking to assert greater influence. It's doing so uh, through the use of proxies in countries like uh, Syria and Yemen. It's doing so uh, via the weaponization of sectarianism. It's, it's doing so via investments in uh, niche or asymmetric capabilities like ballistic missiles uh, and special ops forces. And, and all of this is having an impact. I think Iran's regional influence is higher today than at any time since the Iranian Revolution in 1979 even though Iran's domestic stability is probably more tenuous than any time since the, the Green Movement in 2009. Uh, now, I want to underscore, like, each of these geopolitical challenges is different, um, but taken collectively, I think they indicate a really major change from the post-Cold War era, because they show that uh, what we often refer to as geopolitical revisionism is back, right? That authoritarian countries are, are pushing back against the United States and its allies. They're trying to carve out dominant spheres of influence uh, and they're increasingly willing to use coercion and even violence uh, to do so. Uh, and this brings me to the third trend uh, that I want to talk about, which is that uh, just as geopolitical revisionism has returned, so has ideological revisionism. Uh, so, so after the Cold War, we often thought along the lines of the democratic peace theory that, that basically the, the advance of free and open societies was going to lead to ever greater international peace and stability, right? So ideological transformation was going to lead to geopolitical transformation. But I think what's happening today is that the world is experiencing something like a crisis of democracy. Uh, and we're once again seeing that ideological differences between major powers uh, are driving geopolitical rivalry. Uh, and so for starters, uh, looking back as far back as about 2006, uh, the spread of democracy had, had stalled. So uh, since then, the number of electoral democracies in the world has remained basically stagnant. Uh, it's perhaps even decreased. And the number of democratic breakdowns and the frequency of what's called democratic backsliding have increased. So uh, in every year between 2006 and 2017, uh, countries experiencing declines in freedom outnumbered those experiencing increases in freedom. Right? These, this is according to the statistics that are gathered uh, by places like, like Freedom House. And so if you look at democracy not as sort of a binary yes-no sort of thing, but as a continuum, right? how free is your society on a scale of 1 to 7? Uh, the statistics don't look particularly good over the past decade or so. Uh, and at the same time, the authoritarian models are, are clearly on the offensive. I think it, it was nice to think that the world's remaining dictatorships would kind of quietly fade away after the Cold War. But I think uh, authoritarians around the world basically proved that they could learn and adapt because they just became smarter, they became more skillful, uh, they became more tenacious in holding on to power. And so today we're seeing that, that autocrats are mobilizing the power of technology to, to monitor and repress dissent. Uh, and you can just look at what China is doing right now with respect to big data and, and artificial intelligence and the idea of a social credit score. Uh, you can see that authoritarians have basically paid lip service to, to democratic processes while uh, refining subtler techniques of intimidation and, and manipulation. Uh, there are lots of cases of illiberal or undemocratic rulers who played by the democratic rules of the game before they took power, and, and then they promptly dismantled those rules. Right? That's what's happened in countries like Venezuela uh, or Turkey. Uh, and then if you add in the fact that the democracies were just having a hard time producing um, solid, equitable growth after the 2008 financial crisis, that they were really struggling uh, to provide a sense of cohesion and community uh, amid rapid change, right? this created an, an opening for authoritarian leaders to, to not just pursue authoritarian models at home, but to, but to sort of tout those models to the world. And so now within NATO, we have leaders like Hungary's uh, Viktor Orban uh, 
who are declaring that the future belongs to the, the illiberal authoritarian states. Uh, in Russia and China, you have leaders that, that are really openly proclaiming the virtues of authoritarian governance uh, and authoritarian capitalism. Uh, they're establishing very personalized regimes that are sort of vaguely reminiscent of some of the aspects of, of Maoist or Stalinist governance. Uh, and, and so the world really does seem uh, to be moving in a more authoritarian direction uh, these days. And, and the critical point I want to make here is that uh, great power conflict and the resurgence of authoritarianism are, are linked. Right? It, it's no coincidence that America's foremost geopolitical competitors are dictatorships. Right? Those countries see a dominant democratic America as a threat to their political survival and their global influence. And this is natural. Right? The United States has long said that we see a world full of democracies as the best protection of our own security. Uh, and although we've certainly been willing to, to cooperate with dictators in plenty of circumstances, we, we've generally looked at powerful authoritarian states uh, like Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union as a threat to that project. If you look at it from a Russian or a Chinese perspective, uh, those countries are desperate to make the world safe for authoritarians. And so they view US policy and US power as a threat to, to that project. Uh, and so geopolitical conflict is driven by ideological differences because those differences promote different views of what makes for a good and just and desirable international system. Uh, and then on the flip side, ideological conflict is driven by geopolitical differences because today, Rivals like Russia and China are really working actively to strengthen authoritarianism and to weaken democracy overseas. So, so just look at how um, China has eroded democratic norms in Macau and, and Hong Kong, or how it sought to uh, corrupt democratic governance in, in places from the Philippines to Australia, or how it has supported authoritarian rulers from Southeast Asia to, to Venezuela. Uh, look at the way that Russia ha has subverted or even waged war against democratic governments in, in Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, and Montenegro, or, or look at how both Russia and China have undertaken efforts to undermine the democratic political systems of their major geopolitical competitors. Right? So we've all heard uh, about Russian interference in the US elections in 2016. Right? The bottom line is that this was basically a relatively sophisticated assault that was designed to disrupt US politics and society and thereby make the United States less effective uh, geopolitically. Uh, the basic rule is that China does everything more subtly than, than Russia does it, but it's also been trying to weaken democratic decision making in countries from, Western, from the Western Pacific to the United States by doing things like uh, spreading fake news, by, by bribing or co-opting democratic actors, uh, and so on. And, and so basically, uh, Russia and China think that the United States tries to undermine its authoritarian competitors by spreading democracy, and they're not wrong about that. Uh, and so they're basically saying what's good for the goose is good for the gander. They're trying to weaken their geopolitical adversaries, us, by distorting their democratic processes and exacerbating their internal divisions. Uh, and so the world is seeing a resurgence of governing models that rely on coercion and political violence, and some of those regimes are working to strengthen their rule and expand their influence by, by undermining liberal democracy uh, overseas. Uh, and, and this brings me to uh, a fourth characteristic of the current era. Uh, so during the post-Cold War era, U US policymakers worried a lot about just sort of the general idea of international disorder, that with the end of the Cold War, you'd have all sorts of, of upheaval unleashed in various parts of the world. Uh, and even though I'm, I'm arguing here that the post-Cold War era is over, I, I think what we're now seeing is that this upheaval has, has gotten worse. Uh, and this trend is evident in things that, that probably wouldn't otherwise seem connected. Uh, and, and so one of the things I point to here is, is the emergence of what have sometimes been called super spoilers, right? So these are actors that can't remake the international system, but they can disrupt it in, in big ways. Uh, think North Korea, right? This is a small country. It's a poor country, but it now has a real nuclear arsenal, and it's got a nascent ICBM capability, all of which is controlled by a shrewd and very aggressive leadership. Um, think about ISIS, right? At the height of its power, ISIS really achieved a degree of regional and even global disruption beyond, I think, anything a terrorist organization had accomplished before. And so concern with you know, what it's sometimes called rogue states or rogue actors is, is not new, but, but at no time since uh, Saddam Hussein was defeated in 1991 have the rogues been as powerful as they are today. Uh, and I would say that ISIS also points to another aspect of, of intensifying disorder, which is just that instability is now manifesting itself on a scale that we haven't seen in many years. Uh, it's not quite accurate to say that the Middle East is in crisis. The Middle East is really suffering uh, 
a generalized breakdown of order that's comparable to what Europe went through during the Thirty Years' War in the 17th century. You, you've got military conflicts raging uh, in several locales throughout the region. There's violent instability from one end of the region to the other. Uh, we've seen just the collapse of the traditional Arab state model in a number of countries. All of this is, is happening at once. Uh, and of course, we've, we've also seen a contagion effect, right? Middle Eastern instability has basically been exported to neighboring regions like, like Europe through refugee flows and, and terrorist attacks. And these, these exports have had massive political effects. Look at how the refugee question is destabilizing European politics, for instance. And so the point here is, is that disorder isn't anything new. It's not a recent phenomenon, but disorder of this magnitude is. And if it was hard for the global community to address these sorts of issues, during the 1990s, it's a lot harder now, now that geopolitical competition has come back. And so the example I like to give here uh, is the difference between Bosnia in the 1990s and, and Syria today, right? So in Bosnia, you eventually got a successful US and NATO-led intervention to bring ethnic cleansing to an end. In Syria, we've had nothing of the sort. And in Bosnia, what basically happened was that uh, US dominance and, and America's decent relations with Russia made it possible to get international consensus on the need to use force. Uh, in Syria, you've had US-Russia and US-Iran competition that's basically led to stalemate. And, and so the point here is that the various sources of instability in the world just tend to exacerbate one another. Uh, and then all of this, in turn, uh, is being magnified by a final characteristic of global politics today. And this is just the growing uncertainty as to whether the, the chief defenders of the post-Cold War system uh, and also of global democracy are still willing uh, to play that, that role. Uh, and so take Europe a, as an example here, right? So the European allies ha have for, for decades been our most crucial partner in global affairs. But Europe is just basically in a world-class funk right now. Um, the fate of the EU and the basic cohesion of the continent are, are uncertain at, at best. Uh, you have illiberal and, and often xenophobic movements that are surging in countries' politics around the region. Uh, divisions between northern and southern, eastern and western Europe uh, are deepening, that there are growing splits between those who want to take a stronger line against Russia and China uh, and those who want to pursue closer relations with Moscow and Beijing. Uh, and then, of course, the, the Russians are, are exacerbating all this stuff via cyber attacks, via information warfare, via political meddling and, and other measures. And so Europe still represents a concentration of great power in world affairs. Economic power, certainly. Uh, military power, maybe. But, but today, uh, Europe just doesn't seem like it's capable of acting with unity or with purpose. And at the same time, uh, US leadership is, is facing its greatest crisis in decades. Uh, and the, the point I would just make here is I think uh, this crisis, although we hear a lot about it in the context of the Trump administration, it, it goes back farther than that. It has deeper origins than, than we often think. I think there was always certain to be some sort of questioning of America's global role after the Cold War uh, because the threat that had originally brought that global role about, the Soviet Union, had, had vanished. And, and so, in the more benign environment of the 1990s, it was just inevitable that Americans were going to start asking at some point, why are we still doing so much in the world? Now, I think that that attitude temporarily retreated after 9-11, but it really came back with a vengeance after Afghanistan and particularly after Iraq. I mean, remember, it was President Obama who first said that the United States had to get back to nation building at home uh, and who told Americans that you know, their guiding principle should be don't do stupid stuff. Uh, and if you look at the opinion polling, back even in 2013, 52% of Americans, which was then the highest number in decades, thought that the country should just mind its own business internationally and let other countries get along the best they can on their own. Uh, and then more recently, of course, I mean, all this has been dramatized by the rise of, of President Trump. And I think, uh, I won't go into great detail about this, but basically I, I would argue that Trump's victory in itself showed that Americans were just less interested in playing a leading global role than they had been in the past. I mean, how else could somebody who broke every rule about what you are and aren't supposed to say about foreign policy on the campaign trail still get elected. I mean, remember, the president uh, called for protectionism in trade wars. He, he talked about abandoning U.S. allies. Uh, he talked about downgrading democracy and partnering with, with uh, U.S. adversaries like Vladimir Putin. And he still won the election. Now, I think so far the president's policies ha have in many cases been less radical than, than some of uh, President candidate Trump's rhetoric was. But I think we, we still have a president who has uh, made it clear that he is ambivalent at best about many of America's international responsibilities. Uh, he's often described American leadership as sort of a sucker bet that allows other nations to, to take advantage of us, uh, and, and so on. And so I think that at the very least, countries around the world uh, 
are asking whether the United States is still interested in the sort of global leadership we, we've exerted over the past 70 years, or whether we're seeing the, the early stages of sort of an inward, more, more narrowly focused turn in American foreign policy. And we don't know the answer to that question yet, but what we do know is that there is now deep global uncertainty about US policy, and that uncertainty is actually contributing to, to the global instability uh, at work. And so I think th this uncertainty is likely to promote hedging by US allies who, who worry that our security commitments are no longer so ironclad. I, I think it may provoke sharper challenges for, from aggressors who, who think that the forces restraining them have been weakened. Uh, I think it's going to make it harder to hold the line against gradual Chinese expansionism in the Asia Pacific. I mean, just think about how much more difficult the competition for influence there has become since uh, we withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, I think it's likely to compound uh, the stresses on the global trading system and, and intensify the pressures on democracy. And in fact, and I can go into greater detail on all this, um, you know, some of the early signs of all this are already apparent. And so the bottom line here is that a period of turmoil is a bad time to stoke uncertainty uh, about whether the United States is willing to play its, its stabilizing role in the world. But this is what's happening today. And it's, it's this combination that makes the current moment uh, so dangerous. Now, um, to, to wrap up, I, I don't want to end uh, on a total down note um, because I, I don't think that all is lost. I don't think that the world is, is going to hell in a handbasket. I think the US and its allies uh, still have enormous geopolitical strengths and advantages. Democracy is still uh, incredibly widespread to compare it to almost any other period uh, in the history of the world. Uh, countries like Russia, China, Iran, the countries that are sort of destabilizing the international system today, they have huge weaknesses of their own. Uh, and there has actually been decent international cooperation on some key challenges uh, in recent years. Look at the way that the countries of the world came together to address the 2008 financial crisis, which we just passed the 10th anniversary of a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and so the, the point here isn't necessarily that, that we're living in 1938 and that things are, are very much on the verge of falling apart, that they're destined to fall apart. I, I still think it's, it's possible to make a very effective defense of U.S. interests in the world. I, I think it's possible to defend an international system that's been pretty favorable on, on most key dimensions. But I think that, that requires understanding what we're up against. And what we're up against is an international system. Like we're up against a world that, that has changed fundamentally uh, in some key respects. Uh, and it's changed in some fundamentally challenging respects as well. And I think it's going to take everything we've got to keep it together. So I, I'll go ahead and stop there, and I'd be happy to take any questions, comments, discussion that, that folks happen to have. Sorry. Testing, one, two. Is that working? Yes? OK, great. Um, so I'll start with the first question, if you don't mind. Um, so if we are seeing a rise in authoritarianism, I know you, 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 know, you write and think a lot about US grand strategy. Do you think that the US grand strategy has been successful, let's say, since the, whether you say the late 40s, uh, 70s, or you know, even post-Cold War? And then with that, how has the Trump administration's policies either, either contributed to the success or potential decline of uh, our grand strategy? Thanks. Sure. So um, it's always easy when you're looking at US foreign policy to, to point out the ways in which American policy fails, right? Because the failures tend to be a lot more visible than the successes, and, and because foreign policy is just a hard discipline. It's kind of like baseball, right? If you bat 300, you might get to the, the Hall of Fame. And, and so it's easy to go back and say, you know, the United States uh, has not succeeded in the way we might have wanted to in Iraq, that we've had various failures going back farther to Vietnam or, or Korea or elsewhere. But I, I would make the argument that on the whole, US foreign policy since World War II and since the Cold War as well has been um, enormously successful, just in the sense that, let's say, let's go back to World War II. The, the 70 years since the late 1940s have basically been the best 70 years in human history in terms of avoiding conflict, sort of avoiding devastating wars between the major powers in terms of uh, raising up both American and global prosperity at unprecedented levels, in terms of uh, spreading democracy and respect for human rights farther than they've, they've ever been spread before. And, and I think all of those things happen for a variety of reasons, but one of the key reasons they happen is that the most powerful country in the world, the United States, uh, 
was, was working actively to bring them about. I mean, this was the point of American policy since uh, 1945. And, and we um, you know, encourage these outcomes by doing things like uh, creating alliances in, in key regions so we could sort of stay there and sit on the sources of instability that destabilized those regions before. Uh, we did it through things like leading an open international uh, trading and financial system um, that would uh, sort of the goal was basically to avert a return to the protectionism that had helped cause and, and worsen the Great Depression. Uh, and so there's a lot more detail you could go into on all this, but I would say that in, in general the record has been very, very good if the comparison is to the successes of any other international system in, in the history of, of the world. So how does Donald Trump fit into this? And, and I think that um, I, I take two cracks at this, right? And, and so one is that even good international systems are not perfect. And I think President Trump put his finger on the fact that in the eyes of a lot of Americans, there were aspects of US foreign policy, aspects of sort of you know, what's been called the liberal international order that didn't seem to be working particularly well. Right? And, and so one of the things he always talked about is, you know, we seem to be stuck in these wars without end in the greater Middle East. And I think there was a fair amount uh, of, of truth in that. And it certainly resonated with uh, a certain aspect of the American people. I think he pointed out that there were countries out there like China that had been taking advantage of the open global economy without necessarily opening up themselves. Uh, and, and so I think he, he, I mean, I think he was also right, for instance, that um, there was a burden sharing crisis in, in a number of America's alliances, particularly within NATO, right? When, when Germany, which is, or ought to be, you know, a, a powerful country in its own right, really can't generate any meaningful military power at all beyond its own borders, really can't contribute at all to defend, the, defending the Baltic states, for instance, that's a problem. And so President Trump came along and, and issued a pretty sharp critique. And, but that gets me to my second point, which is that the way that President Trump fits into this is that he is less persuaded of the value of American engagement in support of this international order than any previous president of the post-war era. And, and so you would see previous presidents who said, you know, like Richard Nixon, we've got to get rid of the Bretton Woods financial system because it's killing us. But he said, all right, but we're going to do this, and this will help lead to a new and more liberal form that will help, you know, continue the, the good gains in terms of, of global economic prosperity. President Trump, from what I can tell, seems to believe that this is all a bad deal for the United States, that, that uh, free trade actually is bad for the United States because it leads to the hollowing out of American manufacturing, um, that alliances are a bad deal for the United States because they allow other countries to free ride on us and, and so on and so forth. And all of these uh, critiques have a kernel of truth in them, in, in my view, but I think, I think they're wrong in, in sort of a holistic sense. And, and so the big question of President Trump's presidency, I think, is how far is the administration going to go in departing from the historical patterns of American strategy? Is it just going to be sort of rhetorical jabs at the allies and you know, sort of refusing to explicitly endorse Article 5 in NATO, but not doing anything substantive, or are we going to see bigger departures? And we don't quite know what the answer to that question is, but I think that's the huge question mark in terms of US foreign policy today. So is there any way you see a chance for the US to kind of engage in triangular diplomacy with China and Russia, kind of like we did back in the 70s? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, so in, in theory, this would make a lot of sense, right? So any, any time you're in a triangular relationship, it's more advantageous to have better relations with each of the other two countries than they have with each other if you, if you can do that. And I mean, that was obviously the great insight of Richard Nixon and, and Henry Kissinger, which was that the, the Sino-Soviet alliance was coming apart. Uh, the Chinese were actually very threatened by the Russians and vice versa. Uh, and so there was an opportunity to essentially sort of re redo the triangular diplomacy of the Cold War in a way that paid great dividends for the United States over the long term. It, it's harder for me to see how that happens right now um, for a couple of reasons. One is that I think there's actually um, more sort of ideological and geopolitical glue between the Russians and the Chinese than, than we often think in the sense that they are both countries that are deeply dissatisfied with, with aspects of sort of the world that the United States created because that world was not created by them. They didn't get 
a whole lot of a say in, in how it was created in the first place, and so they feel that it, it slights their interest. Um, there's also some ideological glue in the sense that these are both authoritarian powers, they're both increasingly personalistic um, regimes that, that feel threatened by the, the sort of the promotion of democracy and, and human rights. And that brings me to the second factor, which is that what, what made sort of the triangular diplomacy of the 1970s possible was that Russia and China were at each other's throats at that point, right? And the Chinese in particular uh, were very worried about a potential Russian uh, attack, even an invasion uh, of China. And so they were willing to make compromises and establish a good relationship with the United States because of that fear. That doesn't exist today. Russia and China are getting along fairly well at, at the moment. They may still be long-term rivals in the sense that I think the growth of Chinese power, if it continues, is ultimately going to be as threatening to Russia as it is to anybody else, right? Because you have a big stretch of Russia out in Siberia that, that is sparsely populated. It's got a lot of resources, and the Russians have been concerned for a long time that the Chinese kind of have their eyes on that in one way or another. But, but that hasn't manifested yet. And so um, I wrote a piece about this a couple of months ago where I basically said that, that this you will only get um, uh, you'll only get sort of triangular diplomacy that will succeed on the part of the United States if one of two things happens. And, and the condition here is that you would probably want to lean, if you're the United States, you probably want to lean toward China rather than leaning, sorry, lean toward Russia rather than leaning toward China, right? Russia is the weaker of the two powers, and a triangular relationship makes more sense to learn toward the weaker power rather than the stronger power. But it'll only happen if one of two things occurs. Uh, first, if the Russians conclude that they are not going to be successful in sort of pursuing the geopolitical program they're pursuing now. If they, if they conclude that they're not going to be able to, to intimidate or, or fracture NATO, if they conclude that they're not going to be able to reassert dominance over the post-Soviet space, then perhaps you could get an improvement of U.S.-Russian relations that might make possible more of a triangular relationship. So if things get better, or if things get much, much worse. So if the growth of Chinese power continues at a pretty significant rate, and if the Chinese worry that they're increasingly going to be left in, I'm sorry, the Russians worry they're increasingly going to be left in the dust by China, uh, and that a big, powerful China is going to be a stronger competitor to the Russians in Central Asia, in Siberia, and elsewhere, then the Russians might be willing to cut a better deal with us uh, in terms of improving the relationship and forming some sort of counter-China coalition. But we're, we're not there yet, and I don't think we'll be there for a number of years. Sir, what role do you see uh, media playing into this whole grand strategy, especially with current relations between uh, the administration and the media? Well, I mean, I guess there's, there's two aspects of this, right? And, and so one is um, the effect of media on the situation within the United States, right? And then there's the effect of media on geopolitical competition more broadly. And, on the second part first, I would just say that I think that you know, countries like Russia and China have realized that the media can really be a force multiplier for their influence operations, whether that's sort of disseminating fake news through, through Facebook in some very sophisticated ways, you know, whether that's creating um, you know, basically uh, armies of internet trolls who, who are, are used to put out a particular uh, viewpoint, um, what have you. Both the Russians and the Chinese have been fairly adept at working behind the scenes to advance particular narratives through the media, whether that's RT or Facebook or, or any other uh, platform. And, and that's an area where the United States has traditionally struggled, just in, in part because as a democracy, we are constrained in a way that authoritarian regimes are not. It's harder for us to go out and spread fake news on Facebook, even if we thought that would be a good thing to do, uh, simply because there are rules and, and norms that get in the way. But the second thing, uh, the I guess the first part of the, of the answer actually would have to do with the role of media uh, as it pertains to U.S. foreign policy inside the United States. And I guess the, this is a subject I haven't thought a great deal about, so I'm just riffing a little bit here. But my, I guess my one concern would be that sort of from a superficial look, it often appears that the current media landscape is fueling um, domestic political polarization within the United States in a way that's probably bad for U.S. foreign policy uh, over the long term. And, and so, uh, you know, there have been all sorts of studies that indicate, for instance, 
that if you are on Twitter and you write a tweet, uh, you will get the, the more extreme version of the tweet, the, the, the version that goes out and sort of engages in ad hominem attacks against the person on the other side of the issue, the, the version that uses an expletive rather than not using an expletive, gets liked or retweeted three times as much as sort of the more mild version of the tweet. And so if, if you believe that, then the new forms of media are, are creating an incentive for more uh, volatile forms of political discourse. Uh, and given that the United States is already, already relatively polarized politically uh, relative to most recent periods in its history, that could be fairly concerning. Because if we have further domestic polarization, it's going to make it harder to maintain sort of a consistent, steady foreign policy over time. Uh, if you follow uh, Iran news, you see that uh, they accuse us uh, of very much the same thing, interfering in their affairs all the time, uh, and specifically uh, uh, trying to overthrow their government. Uh, and they have, their evidences for it is, um, for instance, Rudy Giuliani or John Bolton or somebody uh, supporting the opposition in America. Do you think we're doing that? And is it successful, you think, if we are doing that? So it it, it kind of depends on your perspective. So does, does the United States have a well-integrated, um, cohesive policy of regime change in Iran where we are uh, supporting you know, groups that are conspiring to overthrow the government and have a realistic chance of doing so? That, that's an exaggeration, right? We, we're never quite as purposeful and deliberate as countries like China or Russia or Iran think we are. At the same time, we, we are doing things, and we have done things historically, that would be quite threatening to um, uh, certain elements of the Iranian regime, right? So just to give you, uh, you know, one example, we, we engage in, in broadcasting, right, to, to the Iranian population, which is meant to provide an alternative source of information to that provided by the Iranian regime. That is understandably threatening to the Iranian regime. Um, we are always talking about finding ways of empowering moderates within Iran, which uh, if you are sort of, one of a member of the more principalist factions, you understandably interpret that as a threat to your domestic power. And, and so uh, I, I think, you know, and, and now it, it's changed a little bit over the past several months, right? Once we pulled out of JCPOA and, and announced our intention to reimpose sanctions, where it's not entirely clear what the purpose of that is, but um, there have been some comments to suggest that the idea is we're just going to sort of dial up the economic pressure until the regime weakens even further. And so if you're looking at it from Tehran's perspective, yeah, it makes all the sense in the world to think that the United States is, is trying to overthrow the regime. And I don't think there would be that many American policymakers who would be you know, particularly sad or distraught uh, if, the, if the Islamic Republic were, were to fall a few months from now. I, I don't think that means that we have a fully co cohesive and sort of signed on to regime change agenda vis-a-vis -vis Iran, but, but I certainly understand why it would look that way from their perspective. So you talked about the decrease in GDP and def uh, defense spending between the U.S. and its allies, and the world has gone from a unipolarity to a multipolarity. Uh, what key areas do you believe the U.S. and its allies strategically need to focus on to maintain uh, their dominance, their hegemony, or, and do you believe they can? So yeah, they, they can. Um, so you know, if you one of the sort of the weird things about the current moment is that you have countries that still account for about 60% of global GDP wondering whether they can come up with adequate resources to defend themselves, right? NATO is the, the richest grouping of countries in the world, right? And all we hear about is how weak NATO is. And, and so it, this isn't because, you know, NATO lacks the economic, NATO countries lack the economic resources to spend more on defense. It's because they and we have chosen to spend our money on other things. We've chosen to spend our political capital uh, on other things. And so if the question is, in an economic sense, could we invest more in the common defense, the answer is undoubtedly yes. Right? If the question is, will we, the answer is I, I don't know. So you, know, you asked about sort of specific capabilities that would be more useful. Um, 
you, you know, I'll just, I'll just give a couple of examples with the proviso that there are, there are a lot of them that I won't talk about here, either because I'm not familiar with them or just for reasons of time. But, you know, so in the Asia Pacific, for instance, if you take seriously the threat that Chinese uh, A2AD poses, we're not going to be sailing aircraft carriers, you know, into the Taiwan Strait in a conflict between China and Taiwan. We're going to be relying a lot more on uh, long-range strike. Right? And, and so we're going to need a lot more long-range strike assets, whether those are penetrating bombers or just sort of longer-range cruise missiles that you can use to sink Chinese transports right, in, in the Taiwan Strait or something like that. In Eastern Europe, um, you know, you, you can, there's a very good report issued by the RAND Corporation a couple of years ago that talks about uh, a number of the capabilities that would be more useful in, in putting up a, a tougher defense uh, in the event of a Russian invasion of the Baltic states. And this is everything from you know, short-range air defense to uh, heavy armored units to uh, long-range precision strike. And, and so you can sort of run down the list of, of capabilities that we would actually need. You know, our European allies could probably benefit from you know, more investment and in, in lift and sustainment because they really can't get anywhere right now unless we take them there. Um, but I think in, in general, it all, it all comes down to a political decision that we're going to invest more as a society and our allies are going to invest more as societies in these um, geopolitical and security tasks that we have considered important. And that, that really, for me, is one of the key measures of how much will there is left to sustain this international system that's been pretty good to us. Sir, what can the U.S. and its allies do to revive faith in the liberal world order and prevent further backlash against it by citizens throughout the world? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really tough question. Um, so let, let me give you one, one example. So I think you know, a lot of the discomfort with U.S. foreign policy, with you know, the international order, whatever you want to call it today, is basically a backlash against globalization in one form or another, right? And so the, the general take is that globalization has um, enriched well-educated Americans, Americans who are already rich and had sort of the connections uh, to take advantage of more open global markets, but that it's been a catastrophe for the American working and lower middle class, right? Because, you know, the rise of China has uh, led to the proliferation of rusting factories throughout the Midwest and so on and so forth. There's something to this, right? Anytime you're inserting an economy that initially started from such, uh, with, with such low labor costs as China did, it's going to have a disruptive effect on, on other countries' uh, industries. And it did in the United States. But here's, here's the thing. If you look at a lot of the, the deep academic research on what has caused the uh, erosion of the American working class and the American manufacturing base over, say, the past three or four decades, only about 10 to 15 percent of it has to do with, with effects generated by trade, right? The, the other 85 to 90 percent of it has to do with effects generated by things like automation. But it's a lot harder to blame your lost job on a robot than it is to blame it on another country or to blame it on politicians, you know, who deepen trade with that country. And, and so in some ways what we're seeing is uh, an exaggerated backlash against globalization in the sense that, that the ills associated with globalization are often exaggerated. But that, that doesn't make it any less sincerely felt by, by the people who uh, feel uncomfortable with it. Uh, and so, you know, what does what the solution to that look like in, in a political sense? Well, you know, sort of the, the academic in me thinks that it, or hopes that it looks like, you know, greater public education campaigns to talk in more detail about sort of what the actual threats to the American manufacturing base are and so on and so forth, that, that's probably not actually that realistic in terms of what actually will sell in, in American politics. Uh, and so one of the things, um, you know, if, if you had a slightly different uh, approach from the White House, you, you could see sort of more nationalistic rhetoric actually being productive, right? So if you had an administration that said, okay, we are going to make a show of getting tough with China on trade, both because it is useful to do so, and also because we think that will convince Americans to support a free trade agenda in general, then, then I could get behind that, because I think that would be, that would be useful. Uh, 
I think it's less useful to pick a fight with China on trade while also picking fights with all of your allies on trade and talking about how trade is a bad deal in general. I think that'll take us in the other direction. But that's, that's kind of the dilemma we're faced with right now. I'm, I'm curious about your article saying we're returning to a, there's a return to ideological great power competition because it kind of harkens back to this Cold War era. We tend to think of sort of the negative things, the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, arms races, but couldn't we also make the case that maybe if we're returning to a great power competition, this could be a chance for new moon landing type things where yeah. we're actually in competition with somebody else. Wow, we're going we're gonna to be doing great things again uh, because of there's China breathing down our neck. Yeah. Is, is, can you speak a little bit about the positives of what, and maybe space is what, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, just yeah. that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. And I think, um, you know, if you look back at a lot of the things that, you know, we as a country are really proud of that occurred during the Cold War, almost all of them occurred in part as a result of the Cold War. And this, this is everything from desegregation, which was pushed by the, the Eisenhower and Kennedy administrations because they saw this as a critical battleground and sort of the propaganda struggle over who could produce a more just society. It's true of infrastructure, right? The, the basically the Eisenhower highway system is in part generated uh, because we're gonna need to be able to move things around quicker in event of a nuclear war. Um, investment in education and things like that, right? This all ramps up dramatically in the context of, of a Cold War where we're saying that, one, this is a geopolitical contest, but it's also a test of whose system of government can better produce for its citizens and whose system of government can produce a better uh, and, and more equitable and just society. And so if, if you think about it in that, in those terms, I mean, you know, obviously we, we don't want to, uh, we wouldn't necessarily be thankful that we're facing a return of geopolitical tensions with, with powerful nuclear armed countries today, but there are a handful of areas in, in which you would imagine that the, particularly the prospect of competition with China um, could be pretty useful in forcing us to do things that we wouldn't do otherwise. Um, you know, investment in infrastructure would be an obvious example here. This is something that's been a huge, you know, I flew into LaGuardia today, so I, I, got, a, I got a first hand view of sort of the decay of American infrastructure. Um, investment in STEM education, right? Th this is clearly something that's gonna be critical to competition with China or anybody else, and it's another area uh, where we're underfunded. Or, or just something as simple as, you know, getting a handle on long-term American um, fiscal solvency, right? G getting sort of our finances in order and if, even if we do that only because we fear that we won't be able to compete with China over the long term if we don't, that, that would still have hugely beneficial effects. And so, so absolutely, I mean, the way American politics works is that we tend to avoid really hard things until something harder comes along and forces us to confront them. And so if you think that China uh, is as big of a geopolitical challenge and an ideological challenge as I do, then yeah, it absolutely might, and I hope it will force us to tackle some of these difficult issues. Question. I'm going to ask one more question then. Um, so you've also talked a little bit um, in previous articles about the divide between practitioners and academics. Um, and I'm wondering if you can kind of talk about that and do you think that that's going to improve in the age of the Trump administration? Do you see that some of our practitioners are more concerned with um, kind of some of the academic theories and, and language that we have? Or do you think that we'll, we won't really see a, an improvement there? Yeah, so, so I'm, I guess the, the argument I've made about this in the past is that, you know, when we talk about there being a gap between academics and, and policymakers, it's, it has less to do with the things you might think it has to do with, like academics tend to write in dreadful prose that nobody would ever want to read, and, and more to do with the fact that academics and practitioners just, just view the world in, in fundamentally different ways, and like have different approaches to things like uh, risk, and the risks of inaction versus the risks of action, and, and so on and so forth. So with respect to um, how the Trump era will, will change that, uh, I, I think it, it's actually a little bit of a, of a double-edged sword. And so, uh, so one of the arguments uh, that I've made, um, which didn't make me a whole lot of friends within the IR community, was that basically what President Trump has done is he's picked up a critique of U.S. foreign policy that has been common among uh, realist scholars in the IR community uh, 
and sort of became the polit political entrepreneur who, who operationalized that. Uh, and in the same way that you know, some of these scholars have argued that US foreign policy is a bad deal that leads us to get taken advantage of by other countries, you, you can see echoes of that in President Trump's rhetoric and, and, and some of his ideas and, and policies. And so to the extent that that, that critique is getting integrated into the mainstream, I, I don't think that's a good thing. At the same time, I think that the, one of the uh, effects that I think is going to come out of the present era, for, for regardless of, of what you think about President Trump and regardless of whether you think this is a good or a bad thing, is just sort of greater civic engagement in general. I think, I think the current moment has alerted people across the political spectrum to the fact that the stakes of American politics are actually pretty high right now. And I think scholars sort of fall into that group in general. And so I think you're going to see more people who are, are more interested in not just you know, writing journal articles that are only read among the community of experts, but in trying to study important issues and, and to you know, sort of broadcast those findings more widely, whether that's by uh, blogging or writing op-eds or you know, going on TV or going on the radio and that sort of thing. And I, I think that in general that, that will be good because I think there are a lot of subjects where there actually is a high degree of sort of expert knowledge on things that's not sufficiently understood by the non-academic community. And so to the extent that you can sort of, you know, get the ivory tower out into the real world a little bit more, I, I think that in general will have good effects. Okay, I think that that is time. Um, so thank you very much, Dr. Brands, for joining us today. Well, th thank you for having me.